A month ago, I made a journey to Dunfermline in Scotland, where I went back in time to experience the life and times of St. Margaret, Queen of Scotland. It was a spiritually rewarding pilgrimage. As I was travelling through the Scottish countryside, I felt as though the spirit of St. Margaret was close to me, and I felt as though I got to know her, not just as a legendary saint or as a figure of history, but as a person and a friend. If you haven't already seen my Dunfernline journal, my name is Jack Collinson. I'm from Rotherham. I entered the Catholic Church last year without having grown up in a religious family. Having come to faith in Jesus Christ, I'm now seeking to become closer and closer to God through studying the lives of the saints, both of saints gone by and of saints living today. I was at home on a cold January morning my close friend Joe had sent me a book about Belmont Abbey. Joe had been to the Abbey himself, and he was very inspired by the life and the character of the monks living there. I had never visited a Benedictine Abbey before, but I had very much wanted to for a while. The Benedictines are one of the most ancient religious orders. Being so ancient, their life is a very stable one which follows the precepts laid down by their father Benedict many centuries ago. I set off to Belmont Abbey. As I was walking up to the Abbey, I could make out the angelic voices of the monks chanting the divine office. Belmont Abbey is officially known as the Abbey of St. Michael and All Angels. A statue of Michael the Archangel stood vigilant in the Abbey garden. It felt as though the great Archangel was protecting the Abbey with his sword. Monasteries have often been dedicated to the angels who watch over them. A monk's life is one of constant spiritual warfare so it's no surprise if they have often took such powerful spirits to be their patrons. Brother Augustine kindly opened the doors of the Abbey for me. He was expecting me, as I had already made known my visit to the Abbot, Father Paul Stonham. The church of the Abbey was consecrated on the 4th of September 1860. It was the pro-cathedral of the Diocese of Newport and Geneva. The monks were the canons of the diocese then. In the church, there were many sculptures of the angels and the saints. While I was there, one of the monks happened to mention to me that one of the oldest covens of witches in England still met nearby, and that many of the church buildings in the area happened to be dedicated to St. Michael evidence of the unseen and spiritual warfare that many today are unaware of or regard as mere superstition. Father Paul is the abbot, the head of the Benedictine community at Belmont Abbey. He is a mitred abbot, the mitre being the headdress typically reserved to the bishop, one of the highest officers in the church. Right Reverend Don Paul Sonnum, the form of address that his ecclesiastical office entitles him to, is actually a very simple man. St. Benedict's conception of a monastic community was that of a spiritual family. Every monk regards the abbot as their father and the monastery as their permanent home. Therefore, Father Paul was the father of the entire community and according to the rule of St. Benedict itself, he occupies the place of Christ in the community. Here is how he describes the monastic life in his own words. Well, the monastic life is the oldest form of religious life in the church. And it sprang up um, in the third century, spontaneously really, all over the Christian world. Um, whether it's in Celtic countries, um, Spain, North Africa, Egypt, 
Egypt in particular is very important because of St. Anthony and St. Pacomius, uh, Palestine, Syria, Asia Minor, and so on. And St. Benedict uh, writes his rule at the beginning of the 6th century, and um, he legislates, as it were, very basically, very simply, for monks living together in community. And they were called traditionally Cenobites. Um, they lived the Cenobitic life. And the model for that life was the primitive, the early church in Jerusalem, where Christians shared everything, they held everything in common. And they worked together, they prayed together. And the whole point of the monastic life is that we live in community, that we search for God through prayer and work and community life, and that we do it together and that we help one another and support one another in the search for God and in the life of prayer and work and the gospel life. Because St. Benedict says that we follow the gospel as our guide. And I suppose the difference with other religious orders is that, first of all, we belong to a particular monastery. This is our home this is our family, and we make our vows to be monks of a particular monastery, uh, not to monastic life in general, as it were. And so we tend to live in our monasteries or work from them, or do work that is taken on by the monastery itself. Uh, we're not um, an international, as it were, centralized order, divided up into provinces and so on and so forth. Um, so each monastery would be um, autonomous. At the very core of the rule of St. Benedict, which the monks strive strictly to follow, is living constantly in the presence of God. Chapter 19 of the rule says that the divine presence is everywhere and that the eyes of the Lord behold the good and the evil in every place. If you uh put the Benedictines and the Cistercians together because both follow the rule of St. Benedict. The Cistercians are, were a kind of reform of the Benedictines. Um, then, I'm not quite sure how many monasteries, but several hundred monasteries, perhaps even a thousand monasteries or so, um, over the world, throughout, uh, throughout the world, uh, monks, um, nuns, uh, and sisters. Uh, the nuns would be enclosed, taking solemn vows, and the sisters would be um, more active on missions and other work, uh, teaching and so on, and they would take perpetual vows. There's a slight difference there. Um, now then, the, the monks uh, all together form the Benedictine Confederation, and that is um, an association of 19 independent Benedictine congregations that were formed at various times in the history of the church. Some of them are refor reformed um, congregations from the 19th century. Others are medieval, such as the Silverstreens, the Valambrosians, the Camaldolese, and the Olivetans. And then you have the sort of traditional black monks like ourselves, uh, who go back an awful long time. And um, the English Benedictine congregation came together sometime in the 13th century, and they were um, English houses who wished to work together to protect their rights, really, against the invasion of um, uh, foreign, uh, mostly French, um, uh, religious uh, or monastic um, uh, uh, orders such as Cluny and so on. But um, yes, well, as I say, we have a confederation of independent congregations made up of autonomous houses, and we do have an abbot primate who lives in Rome, but he doesn't actually have jurisdiction, but he's the honorary head, as it were, of the Benedictines, and he lives at Sant'Anselmo which is also an international uh, college, university, 
uh, which is frequented by uh, Benedictines and others. Uh, many of the professors, uh, both, both past and present, are, are, are famous Benedictine uh, historians and liturgists and theologians. I met a monk named Brother Bernard, a walking encyclopedia. He is the oblate master. Brother Bernard was a man who had a thorough knowledge of Benedictine spirituality. He explained to me the history of the abbey. Our abbey um, was founded, I think the abbot probably has told you, uh, around 1857, 58. It was actually consecrated in 1860. Um, and it came about through a local Catholic sort of landowner, a man who converted to Catholicism, um, building a church in Thanksgiving. And at the same time, Thomas Joseph Brown, a monk of Downside who became Bishop of the Welsh district, and Hereford has always been attached to that. Uh, he wanted a place for his cathedral. And he also wanted to revive the very English tradition of cathedral priories. Because in England, before the Reformation, before the dissolution of the abbeys, there were at least eight cathedrals run by Benedictine monks. And um, it was a peculiar English thing. Um, the only other place that did it was Sicily, and that was because of the Normans taking it there. And um, anyway, he asked permission from Rome to set up a cathedral priory. They didn't know what on earth he was talking about, but he got permission. And this became a cathedral priory with a cathedral prior, um, normally from another abbey. And at that time, the community here was made up of monks from other abbeys as professors teaching young monks from the other abbeys. Uh, this was called a common house of studies. So it was, it was sort of set up like that. So most of our cathedral priors came from either Downside Abbey or Ampleforth Abbey uh, over the years that it was the cathedral priory. Then in 1917, the cathedral was moved and set up in Cardiff. For a time, there were two cathedrals and two chapters, a Benedictine one and a, a secular one. Um, but eventually it went to Cardiff and then we became an independent community in 1920. The aim of every monk at Belmont Abbey is to accept Christ's invitation to take up your daily cross and to follow him. Benedictine spirituality is about the imitation of Christ. But there is another reason why the monks join together five to seven times a day. The bell rang at 12 noon when the monks entered the church to recite the Divine Office, where I joined them. On the CDs produced by the monks of Belmont, they describe themselves as non-professional singers, but I think that this is just them being modest. Because when these men sing together, they sound like a choir of angels. In their devotion, in the humble look in their eyes, you can really see their souls being lifted up to heaven. It's no wonder that the Abbey has all the angels for its patrons. It seems that angels sometimes dress up as Benedictines. The canonical hours mark the divisions of the day in terms of periods of fixed prayers at regular intervals. The church calls it Officium Divinum, or Divine Office. The layman calls it the Liturgy of the Hours. The Divine Office is sung by the Benedictines, their voices rising up to heaven like incense before the throne of the Almighty. Let them praise his name with young sing, and make music with timbrel and all. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the poor with salvation. Blessed be The monks very graciously invited me to join in their lunch. The refectory itself had the feeling of a chapel. They take turns each day in serving food, and today it's Father Jonathan's turn. Following St. Benedict's rule, the monks eat together and listen to a spiritual reading, today read by Brother Bernard, so that they can meditate even while they eat. Sometimes it may be the gospel, or the lives of the saints, or a spiritual text. 
This was the abbey's daily practice. The monks prayed ceaselessly. On the 13th of April, before the Royal Commission, Moore refused the oath required by the Act of Succession. He was imprisoned for a few days. By the 17th of April, he was in the tower. He was to be kept there for 15 months. As he knew well, he had effectively signed his own death warrant. For Moore, as well as being the final spiritual training for martyrdom, Belmont Abbey has about 40 members in its community, about 20 of whom are resident monks in the monastery itself. There are priests and there are brothers. Each one is given their appointed task and they are all obedient to the abbot. So what brought each of them to the abbey in the first place? To the religious life and for some to the priesthood? Was it a matter of choice or was it something far greater than that? Brother Augustine who opened the doors of the abbey for me, is a fine young man who made his solemn profession as a Benedictine monk. My parish at home, Abergavenny, not too far away from Belmont, is, um, is actually, it's, the priest there is provided by Belmont. And that's one of the works they do is they send out monks of priests in the local area and not so local area as well. But um, yeah, so that's how I got to know the community because they were, we've had a few different monks from here as the priests there. And in fact, I got to know more of the ones who were the priests out and about as opposed to the ones who were in the community. We I visit a few times uh, every year. They have the May procession in honor of Our Lady. And so we have a little sort of at about nine o'clock at night, torchlight procession around the grounds, very Lord's-esque. And yeah, but that's very nice. And yeah, saying the rosary as you go around. And so that's how I would have said I got to know the place more. And really it wasn't until sort of university where I sort of got to be more involved with my faith and I went to Swansea and in fact there was um, we had a parish in Swansea um, at Belmont and so I I wasn't too involved with that one but I did know about it and so it was always sort of something that was present in my life the Benedictine connection and it was just weird that there was always something to do with Benedictines connected to whatever I seemed to do and it's just my last year of university, it was, I can remember that um, it just suddenly struck me that this is what I felt God was calling me to do. And it was the monastic side of things that really attracted me. Monks are wedded to Belmont Abbey for life when they make their final vows or solemn profession. That is when they surrender their lives entirely to God and make a lifelong commitment to the community. Well, a solemn profession of vows um, takes place normally after at least four and a half years of being here at least can be a bit longer if you want it to be or the community might think you need longer to prepare um, and this the 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 taking of the vows we sing the vows we you write them out by hand on, on a piece of paper and they are sung and then um, they're signed on the altar by yourself by the abbot and by the uh, uh, secretary to the council of the abbey and then there's the ceremony of the sushi pay, where the monk sings it, the offering of asking God to uphold him according to his promise and let his hopes not be confounded. We sing it in Latin. And very often the hands are extended as it's done. It's done three times, slightly higher each note, a little bit like the Good Friday, this is a wood of the cross type of thing. And then we have a prostration on or under a funeral pole, which is spread out. Um, and while you're on that, the Litany of the Saints is sung. Um, and once you're professed we're here, we, you actually um, spend three days in isolation, really. We call it going in the tomb. So there's a symbolism of dying with Christ, like baptism, dying with Christ and then rising with him. So we don't have any celebrations straight after the profession mass. That have to, has to wait three days. And then after that, you, we have a celebration with the, with the newly professed. Belmont Abbey's monks have a disciplined life and all their activities have Christ for their destination. They have a varied apostolate. The Benedictines have a, a varied apostolate. Um, the Benedictines, the English congregation to which Belmont belongs, uh, are mostly involved with schools. Um, the monasteries of Ampleforth uh, and Downside and Ealing and Worth, the part of the same congregation, all have 
um, secondary schools. Uh, but Belmont, um, it had a secondary school, but we had to give it up uh, 20 years ago. Um, but having said that, most of the monasteries, the English Benedictine congregation, have parishes of monks involved in parishes of priests. And, um, and Belmont uh, has a lot of parishes, uh, mostly based around the Abbey in Herefordshire. We've got one parish over in Monmouthshire in Wales, and we have one right up in Cumbria. So we have our parishes. Um, and then another part of our postulate is to do with retreats. Uh, we don't go out and give retreats, but we have people come here and we give a series of retreats, a program uh, uh, throughout the year, um, usually looking at a certain theme over a weekend with talks and, and the people come uh, for the divine office and mass and sort of live part of our life um, here at Belmont. The Abbey has a rich library which supplies the monks with an endless resource for spiritual reading. Father Jonathan showed me into the library. Dom Brendan Thomas writes that St. Benedict did not intend his rule to contain anything new or innovative. His genius lied in how he drew prudently from past sources, together with his own discerning judgment, to produce a document that is both spiritual and highly practical. The rule of St. Benedict is the Abbey's engine, with the Abbot taking the steering wheel. It's the Abbot's responsibility to maintain the community and to make sure that it is always living according to the rule. Each day they have chapter, a meeting where the rule is read from. On that particular day they read the part of the rule which describes the qualities expected of a good Abbot. He is to be prudent, chaste, sober, merciful and loving towards the brethren. If you read the rule of St. Benedict, there are two quite long chapters on what sort of man the abbot should be. And uh, uh, really it's quite frightening for me to read that because <laughs> I can't see any of the qualities in me. But um, obviously an abbot um, has to be a reasonably mature person, uh, calm and peaceful prayerful, um, able to, to listen and give good advice. He needs to be a reasonably good administrator as well, uh, because obviously um, he also needs to appoint collaborators, like the prior, the novice master, the, the bursar, um, the sacristan, the oblate master, the oblates are lay associates, and so they also have a monk who is in, uh, responsible for their spiritual growth and so on. And so it's important that the abbot be someone who can work as a member or head of a team and delegate and share his responsibility. I really enjoyed my time at the abbey. The monks there were all very gracious to me. I got a brief glimpse of a very ancient way of life, one whose every moment is dedicated to God. I could see the effect this life had had on each of the monks. In one sense, they were all just as ordinary and human as you and I, but you could see God's grace working in them in a special way, which brought out what was best in each of them. The solitude of the Abbey, the brotherhood of the community, the stability of an ancient and unbroken tradition and the peace of a life with few possessions. This is the foundation, the firm rock, which allows the monks of Belmont Abbey stand together as brothers in Christ and live a harmonious life, constant hymn that is a bridge between heaven and earth. As I left the Abbey, the words of St. Benedict were repeatedly echoing in my ears. Listen and attend with the ear of your heart.